Does that work? <sighs> Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody, for showing up here at the end. Um, I uh, <clears throat> actually sent uh, Julia a title for this talk, which was uh, Everything I uh, Know About Ecosystem Management I Learned from Andre. She rejected the title. But, um, and, and she made it. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I have this one up here because that's, that's her title for me. I, and anybody who knows me uh, knows I know absolutely nothing about practical realities. Um, and before I actually say anything, I want to take this opportunity, and I'll try to remember to do this as we go through as well, to thank um, the people who are working with me right now. This is most of the people in my crew currently, except for uh, Rachel, uh, who now works for Tim. We got rid of her. Um, and, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show today is, I mean, it's really their, their stuff that, that we've done together, or they've done, and I stole them. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so I sort of took the, the uh, title of this whole series kind of seriously, you know, where sustainability meets reality. Ten weeks, ten opinions. I actually should tell you I misread it. Um, I thought uh, it was uh, one week and ten opinions, so there's going to be a lot of different opinions um, that I'll throw in here, mostly unsubstantiated by data. Um, which is more fun. Um, this seems annoying. Um, and the other guiding principle uh, was uh, something in Julia, um, and, and I really took this to heart. Um, <laughs> and I should say before we get going that the, my objective here is actually not to give you any answers because uh, I don't actually have any. Um, but what I'd like to do is really um, try to stimulate discussion and, and maybe some new ideas that could happen over a beer. Um, so what I'm going to do is first uh, sort of deal with the question, um, do we really need ecosystem-based management, EBM, for sustainable fisheries? And I'm going to argue that, well, sort of. Um, but, you know, I'm not a big... Uh, believer in, 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 in that this is the appropriate, really strong place where we need ecosystem management. Instead, I uh, argue that what we really need is in a different realm, marine conservation. Um, and then I'm going to go to the final part of most of my talk, where I'm going to sort of discuss integrated ecosystem assessments as a tool to, to get to um, ecosystem management. <clears throat> So the first part, so what is sustainable fishing? So this is something I actually don't need to tell this audience, but I'm going to because, you know, it sort of helps set the stage. So according to NIMS, and they pay me, so this is true, it has to be true, that sustainable fishing means that we have um, healthy stocks of fish um, that are important for commercial, recreational, subsistence fisheries and that we increase the long-term economic, economic and social benefits coming from those fisheries. So probably you've seen this figure from one of Ray's papers and colleagues. And so this is, I think, really emphasizes the idea of what it means to be sustainable in a fishery sense. So here we have unfished spawning stock of orange roughy. Here's yield. And this is like standard. This is like, and every, everybody here knows this. And basically the idea is you fish down the spawning stock and you get somewhere in your MSY. And the point in this case is that you actually do a lot of fishing to get to that point. And Ray points out here that that, um, you know, basically people do okay. They, they have, with some sort of variance, sustainable yields in this fishery. Um, and, and, but we can then, so, um, so in this case, it seems to be a sustainable fishery. Is there something special about New Zealand that makes it really different than other places? Um, and this is where we can sort of jump here. I was hired, as, as uh, Tim said, well around uh, 2000. And I came here to the, the um, Seattle, the Fishery Science Center. This doesn't show up so well. I'm sorry about that. But it's very colorful. 
Um, and um, the way this, this plot is set up is the green it, are stock West Coast. West Coast uh, brown fish that um, are not overfished, and there's no overfishing happening on them. So these, um, in this panel, these stocks are in good shape. Up here we have um, stocks. Well, they're not overfished, but there is overfishing happening. So there's one here, um, yellowtail rockfish. Um, up here in the upper left, um, this is bad. So these are, these are species that are overfished, and we're still overfishing them. This is not a good thing. Um, and then down here we have no overfishing and overfished. So this is in 2000. Um, after working, and I take full credit for this, even though I have nothing whatsoever to do with it, somehow after I got hired, things seem to get better. Um, you see uh, basically nothing above this line. So the, there's no more overfishing occurring. And the number of stocks in this uh, overfish category has been cut in, I think, about half. And so the situation is getting a lot better. Um, so we can then ask the question, so these are, and there's lots of examples where we have success in fisheries management. And we can say, well, you know, it must be like the last 10 years were all about ecosystem management. You know, is this the result of ecosystem management? And so we have to define ecosystem management. It seems like a good thing to do. Um, and so I'm using here a definition from, um, uh, this is actually from COMPASS, which I can't remember what it stands for, communication something, something, C. Um, <laughs> I can't remember what it is. But this is from a, a consensus statement signed by a couple hundred individuals. And what they define is some key components. One is an integrated approach to management that considers the entire ecosystem. Um, it, it emphasizes the protection of structure and function of the ecosystem. It accounts for the interconnections among the species in the food web, as well as species and the environment. And of course, it's, it's place-based, so it's spatially explicit. So if you think about this, and so, uh, okay, are these examples of fisheries management the result of ecosystem management? I don't think so. I mean, the, uh, no. Uh, they're not. Um, and we can argue about that if you want to, but I just don't think so. Um, and it's interesting to start thinking about this. I think that why we have successes, it seems to me that we have better single species models. Um, and, and that there's been, in a sense, sort of adaptive modeling that in a way implicitly accounts for ecosystem processes. So there's lots of uncertainty in the parameters and stock assessment models. And initially they were wrong and they're getting better and, and people are becoming more accurate, I think, in, in the um, forecasts. Why is it? I think in the hill, even the parameters are accounting for ecosystem processes implicitly, not explicitly. Um, so in a way, I think single, and people have argued, uh, and I know we've heard that single species approaches are maybe okay. Um, I think they're incredibly inefficient, though. I mean, adaptive modeling in a way that you can imagine it happening is not terribly inefficient. Also, um, I think if you include sort of ecosystem information in single species management, it basically allows you to get away from errors that are otherwise preventable. Um, and it also allows you, and I think the Alaska Fisheries Science Center is doing a really the best job of this is being essentially str strategically precautionary. It allows you to, to um, anticipate and, and sort of lean towards a more precautionary approach given ecosystem information, even if it's qualitative in nature. But <clears throat> um, if you think about you know, what we're doing when we're fishing um, to the ecosystem, and basically sustainable fishing means that you, you kill a lot of fish. Um, that's, that's the name of the game. Um, and so let's take a slightly different look at the West Coast fishery, not from are we having sustainable fisheries, but the potential impact of those fisheries on an ecosystem. So you can simply look at just the survey data. For this is from the um, MIMS trawl survey, and just ask what's the trend in the data over the last 20 or so years, 25 years, and this is the average annual change, so it's, um, 
you know, point 0.1, point 0.2, positive or negative. And so basically, we see, we see, we see increases in flatfish, sort of a mixed bag with rockfish, and these are mostly skates, and they've mostly increased. Um, and then you can do something where you just say, okay, let's look at these species. Um, you can imagine lots of different life history parameters or other things, and say, okay, let's put those into a principal component. We can generate these principal components, and then plot the trend versus the principal component. When you see this, you get a negative relationship between things like maximum age, size, and maturity, and the trend in abundance versus growth rate. So things that are really declining, um, these are things that are big, live a long time. Um, and then over here we have little fish, things with high growth rates, and those are the ones that are doing well. So this is not, you know, sort of rapid science, it's intuitive. Um, and um, so what this means then is that by fishing, <clears throat> and the differential effects of fishing means that we're changing the composition of the community. So this is just a simple example of this where we have large, the ratio of large to small rockfish over time. And what we see is here in the early part of the time series, about 1980, and you have a system that's dominated by large rockfish. Now we have a system that's dominated by small rockfish. That's Rachel. Um, so, and then um, the same thing occurs when we look at the ratio to large rockfish to flatfish. So we start off with this, a situation where it's basically 50-50, um, and now we're in a situation where only about 10% uh, of the animals caught in the survey are large rockfish, more like um, much more are flatfish. So this has real consequences for what's going on in the community. And I'd like to illustrate this with a paper that um, was really led by, this is uh, Chris Hardy. And <clears throat> what he did was do a bioenergetics model. And, and from that bioenergetics model, he was able to estimate consumption by different species and in different regions. And so we focus on a group of rockfish, short belly striped tail, green striped chili pepper, and bokachi that co-occur. They live in about the same habitats, they eat a lot of the same things. And so we just said, okay, well, we, we've done this experiment. If you were on fishing, we've done a lot of fishing, we've changed the nature of the community. So what is the byproduct of that? And so what we're looking at here is the estimated total consumption by species um, at the beginning of our time series in 1980 versus 2001. And then this 2001, extra 2001, is if we not only account for differences in numbers, but we also account for the fact that most fish are now smaller than they were 25 years ago just because of size selective harvest. <clears throat> so if you do that, we see 1980, basically you have this big yellow bar, that's Boccaccio, that's gone in 2001. Instead, it's dominated by um, green stripe. And this is off of Oregon. If we look at um, a little bit further south, you see something similar, where you have a big Boccaccio bar that's disappeared, but now the system is dominated by stripe tails. Um, in Northern California, it's a little bit different. You sort of have this balance between Boccaccio, chili pepper, uh, striped tail, and short belly. But now the consumption is running through uh, mostly chili pepper. And in Central California, again, a similar story except for this time, short belly. So uh, the flow of energy through the system is, is dramatically different now than it was just 25 years ago. Another thing that um, we can think about is sort of the, when, we, when we fish a system, we, um, and we do this in lots of places and lots of systems, we take it apart, we disassemble the system. Um, and so if we think about this, and, and this is something that's, that's I've been thinking about for um, two days uh, now, deeply for two days. But it's an idea that has been tossing around and, and in, um, Jamil Samari and I have been sort of playing around with this idea. So we take systems apart. That's what we do. Fishing does it, pollution does it, invasive species and so forth. So we take it apart. And the question is, does it matter how we take it apart in terms of its ability to recover? So we ask the question here, how does a community, this is, how does community disassembly 
So how does taking apart a community affect the community or ecosystem function and its ability to recover? Um, and so we figured to do this, what we need to be able to do is to take apart systems in a controlled, known way. Um, and then estimate changes in some sort of metric of function and then determine if differences in how we took apart the community influences its ability to rebound. So um, to do this, and I emphasize the super, very, quite preliminary nature of this, um, we use John Field's um, Ecopath model. So you're familiar, and again, this is, I want to you know, give credit to Jamil. There's Jamil, you can find him. This is what he looks like. Buy him a beer. Um, so you're <coughs> probably familiar with Ecopath. Path with ecosystem. Here's a basic um, equation where we have change of biomass, which is a function of growth, losses to predation, immigration, and then losses to mortality, fishing, and immigration. I'm not going to go into much detail about ecosystem. I'm going to assume some knowledge. <clears throat> and what I want to do is give you three scenarios that we considered. First, if we sequentially fish down a system from high to tro lower trophic level. So in this case, what we did was apply fishing sequentially to arrowtooth founder, the uh, shelf rockfish group as aggregate in the ecopath, hake, then forage fish, then shrimp. So you can do it sort of basically fishing down the food web, or you can fish up the food web. Um, so we reverse the order. So you start with shrimp and you go up to arrowtooth. Or a third scenario is we basically apply the same average fishing mortality um, over the 75 years that we ran in the simulations, okay, but we spread it out evenly over time instead of doing it sequentially. And again, this is really preliminary, like hours ago. Um, and, and the results are just intriguing to me in ways. So, so what you see here is the number of fish groups. This is basically... Um, if we start with the uh, circles, this is fishing down the food web. So we're starting um, with um, arrow tooth and moving down that way. So basically, at some point, you get to where we fished everything. And this is total production. And total production is lower if we fish sequentially than if we fish everything simultaneously. Um, and the same is true for this ratio of primary production to total respiration. So just two measures of ecosystem function. So the idea is that, and this is again um, super preliminary, but the idea is that um, what you fish, when you fish it, um, may influence how the system functions. And we're working now on trying to see if the reverse tra trajectory holds true. So we don't think we can really do this with Ecopath. Um, and we're going to shift to another model, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the idea is that um, it's not just how much. It might be the order and sort of the, how you do it. Um, so maybe it's obvious. Um, but there's a trade-off um, between what you might see on your plate, say, paints your rockfish with crab tin pool and this uh, user glaze. I'm not dropping any hints to anybody. Um, um, versus what's uh, in the water. So, so there's, I mean, this is like not, again, this is not like great news, but there's trade-offs between um, fishing and conservation goals, even um, sustainable fishing and conservation goals. I think it gets more interesting when we start moving beyond fisheries. Instead of thinking about just fisheries goals and conservation goals, but we think about a situation like Puget Sound where we have multiple mandates and multiple objectives. In this situation, we're not just concerned about species and food webs and the habitats they use, but also as a goal, not only a driver in the system, water quality, the quantity of fresh water going through streams, and human health and well-being all together sort of roll up into overarching ecosystem strategies. So <clears throat> that's where I think it begins to get quite quite interesting. And we all know that it's in these situations that we need ecosystem management. And we all love it. Everybody, you know, it's apple pie. Who doesn't love ecosystem management? But um, I think the, the challenge is what do you do? It's like we have 
I can tell you, uh, my office is loaded not only with my own platitudes, but the platitudes with many people telling me that ecosystem management is a great idea, but very few people actually are providing practical advice on how to proceed to implement EBM. <clears throat> and so what I'd like to do now is to, to talk about a little bit about the, the NOAA's sort of new approach to implementing EBM. So this is an idea that actually originated with Dave uh, Fluharty and then um, kind of went crazy in the government system, as these things often do. Um, and it's the idea of an integrated ecosystem assessment. So an integrated ecosystem assessment we're defining as a synthesis and quantitative analysis of information physical information, chemical, ecological, and socioeconomic um, in relation to specified management objectives. So those objectives may be fisheries, but they may also be something to do with biotourism, or they may have something to do with human health, whatever those are. And so we argue, and I think it, you know, we agree that to do this kind of analysis, it has to be uh, responsive to public policy and be relevant. Um, we, we want it to be quantitative. It's not just going out and saying stuff, you know, let's, you know, bring back whatever. Um, we want a quantitative analysis that focuses on uncertainty. Um, it should be open and include public participation, um, interdisciplinary. Um, this is not an exercise that's going to involve a lot of like going out and getting new data. It's going to use existing data. Um, and the idea is that in, in the context of uh, forecasting the future, that we would use the so-called management strategy evaluation approach to forecast future conditions and outcomes given a range of management scenarios. So I wasn't actually uh, joking about Andre. I mean, this is probably stolen from him some, someplace. Um, so what it looks like um, schematically is this. So when we do an IEA, we'll have a scoping process. Um, we'll move from that scoping process to develop indicators and thresholds, management benchmarks for those indicators. Those have to relate back to whatever management question is at hand. It doesn't do any good to have a bunch of indicators that are relevant to management because we are engaged in, in doing that practical side of things. Um, we do a risk analysis on those um, indicators. Um, those risk analyses are rolled up into a, a, a total assessment of ecosystem status. That feeds into a management strategy evaluation where we begin to say, OK, well, if, if the ecosystem is in a state where we want it to be, what do we have to do to get it there? And then these management actions feed back into a, a monitoring and new data acquisition so we can identify data gaps um, and also monitor the indicators that we've, indi that we've suggested are appropriate. What I'd like to do now is, is take a second and go through each of these steps. Oh, except I'm going to say, we're doing two of them. One for Puget Sound and one for the California Current here on the West Coast. Um, so let's, let's start with scoping. Um, the easy thing to do with scoping is, is just to sort of make a dichotomy and, and realize the importance of this dichotomy. And I think it illustrates the importance of, of really defining the management objectives. So you can imagine one management objective being to foster multiple human uses of the system. And you, you limit those uses so um, you know, totally screw up the environment, the, those uses are subject to environmental constraints. So the key principles, if you have this goal, are sustain yields, minimize environmental impact, and um, consider socioeconomic costs. A very similar um, goal would be to promote ecological integrity while allowing human use. So instead of a different place, it's very similar, um, but we basically are starting with the ecology as the primary goal, and you allow fishing in instead of the opposite. If you do this, um, the key principles are, are ecological, essentially. We're focused on interactions, um, especially biotic interactions. Um, and the idea is to build resilience into biological and human systems. So this is, it's a very subtle difference, but I think it's important. And I, 
And I think that these little sort of minor phrasing differences, although they might seem trivial, aren't. And um, this was made clear to me about a week ago uh, when I was listening to NPR. And uh, there's a guy in NPR, an economist, um, and I actually discovered a whole new field called behavioral economics. And it was really cool. And he mentioned one example. And, and this, I think, is actually quite relevant to, um, to, to the notion of scoping and goal setting. This is a paper by Johnson Goldstein a few years ago in Science. And what they looked at is the percent of individuals consenting to organ donation in different countries. So some countries, like 99% of the people are signed up to donate organs. Um, a bunch of other countries, not so much. So why? So you can think of all sorts of reasons. Think of, you know, culture, religion. And, but if you look at this, it's like here's Germany and here's Austria. Germany's at 12, Austria's at 99. So I don't think that the religion and culture differs so much that that would explain that amount of difference. And, and likewise, here's Sweden and Denmark. I mean, I know they're different, but are they that different? Well, it turns out if you look at it closely, <clears throat> it has to do with how you sign up for a donation. On your driver's license in, say, Germany, it said, there's a question that says, do you want to donate your organ when you die? It's a big decision. You have to check, yes, I want to do that. People don't check yes. If you ask them to check yes, they don't. The default is just no. If you go to these countries, the driver's license is different. What it says there is, check if you don't want to donate your organ. Nobody checks. The thing is, nobody checks. Nobody, you know, it has nothing to do with what they want. It has to do with the fact that it's a big decision. And it's too big, and it's like, I'm not going to check. And so, simply by phrasing the question in a certain way, you dramatically affect public policy. And so, I think the scoping process is important because we need to sit down, we need to, in the scoping process, clarify what's the default situation. Is the default fisheries, is it ecological integrity, is it some sort of multiple use or whatever you can think of, but how you think about that scoping and objective setting ultimately could influence um, public policy if you buy the organ donation analogy. <clears throat> Moving on to ecosystem indicators, the next step in our approach. So the Millennium Assessment defines an indicator as information that's based on measured data. So it has to be something you go out and measure. Um, it's not something you take out of a model. Um, it's, it's basically representing some attribute or characteristic of the, of the environment that we're interested in. So as an example, you might be really interested in having a resilient or stable ecosystem. Um, you can't measure that. You, you know, can't go on a boat and you know, count the number of stabilities. You know, what you need to do is measure some proxy for that. And so some people have suggested diversity as a proxy for that or whatever. But the point is that you need to sort of think about indicators as representative things that we're really interested in. <clears throat> and you can also think about indicators um, in a way, and this is sort of a little bit how the European Union does it, um, where we think about a system of drivers, pressures, state, impacts, and response. So each one of these little boxes could potentially have um, a suite of indicators associated with it. So for example, a driver might be seafood demand. So seafood demand is a socioeconomic driver which is going to influence fishing effort. So we can have um, economic indicators of seafood demand. We can have lots of indicators, even direct measures, of fishing effort. Um, this is going to eventually affect state variables. And state variables are often the things that we're most interested in. So this could be the biomass of target species, or it could be diversity or some other conservation things, whatever it is. Um, and the biomass is going to feed into some sort of impact. So if we change um, the biomass, we're going to affect potentially, in this example, fisheries yield. And you can imagine all sorts of different examples for this. Um, this will eventually um, feed into 
management. And there's, of course, indicators that you could measure for a governance structure and how well it's functioning and responding to some sort of impact. And then this will feed into potentially demand or it could even just go directly to effort. But in any event, you get the idea and you can break up the world into these different sorts of categories. Um, where we started on focusing on Puget Sound and really focusing on state variables because they're what we know about um, and they're easy. Um, so you can think about um, selecting attributes of interest. And so they might be related to nutrient cycling, energetics, food webs, whatever. Um, and then we're using models, starting with Ecopath Ecosystem because it's easy, but moving into more complex models, and, and performing various perturbations on those models. And the idea is that we'll examine correlations between changes in attribute and changes in indicator. So if an indicator is, is useful, it will correlate to the attribute that we're interested in. Um, and again, this is stuff we're just beginning. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit from the Georgia Strait model. This is stuff that Jamil is doing. Here's his picture again. Um, and Chris Harvey uh, will be heavily involved very soon um, in this. And so here's a, just some sort of flavor of what we mean by what's a good indicator, a bad indicator, and so forth. So you can imagine a uh, mean trophic level. It turns out this is a reasonably good, broad indicator. So I have mean uh, trophic level here on the x-axis, on the y-axis are various um, attributes like total production, the ratio of primary production to respiration. This is the biomass of charismatic groups. Well, love charismatic groups. And this is the biomass of target groups. And basically, you see that there's a reasonably good correlation between um, mean trophic level in each of these groups. Um, of course, if you just looked at the trophic level of the cat, it's a lousy indicator. It doesn't tell you anything. Um, there's, it's either just it's, it's useless. Um, some indicators turn out to be okay, but not for everything, just restricted cases. So this is a ratio of forage fish to jellyfish, and there's sort of a reasonable negative relationship between forage fish to jellyfish biomass ratio and the ratio of primary production to total biomass. So that's a negative relationship, the rest is a mess. So some indicators are broad, some are lousy, some are restricted, but the point is we can go through this exercise and not just simply pull out indicators because they sound good or because somebody else said they're good, they're good, we can go through and examine the greater which they actually reflect the properties of the ecosystem that we're interested in. So I'll move over to uh, risk analysis next. So in a risk analysis, there's lots of different ways you could, could do a risk analysis for the ecosystem. One way that we're um, adopting, and this is, again, somewhat stolen from uh, Australia, actually, is the idea that we can plot the world on two axes. Um, from low to high, the susceptibility of an indicator to some sort of impact, its vulnerability to something really bad happening, either human or natural. Um, and then the resiliency, this is low to high, of the indicator to the perturbation. So if it does get slammed, how resilient is it? How quickly will it bounce back from that particular um, perturbation? And so you can imagine this um, world where you have kind of low uh, resiliency and high susceptibility as being, that's a high risk world, that's not a good thing. On the other hand, you could be the opposite, where you have very high resiliency and low risk, and so uh, low susceptibility, and that's low risk. And then you have this combination of resiliencies and susceptibilities that's moderate. So you can, you can imagine lots of scenarios where you could uh, be a high risk, and there's two ways to get out of a high risk situation. If you can affect the resiliency, that, that reduces your risk, or you can lower your susceptibility, and that would also lower your risk, or you can do both. So the, the hard thing is actually measuring this stuff. Um, and so again, this is something that Jamil and I have been working on and thinking about different ways we might get at the resiliency of indicators. In this case, um, what we did was, and again, in our model, subject the indicators to a whole bunch of different 
um, perturbations. Um, short perturbations and then stop the perturbation and then simply measure the time to recovery. So some indicators like the entropical level bounce back pretty quickly or weren't very responsive at all. Um, others sort of more moderate and other things, in this case pinnipeds, which have a long generation time, um, don't recover very quickly from perturbation. So the other axis is um, susceptibility. And so this is actually uh, turned out to be quite difficult to look at. And this is something that I grabbed from Mary Ruckel's house. I actually was going to show a picture of Mary Ruckel's house, and I didn't have one. So I stood outside her office for an hour. And the best thing I could get <laughs> is a picture of Mary on a conference call, which is her normal position. Um, and so this is uh, Mary's uh, threat summary for, uh, and it's not complete yet, but for Puget Sound. And you get the idea that you know, for some different threats like habitat, in some places it's really okay, in some cases it's really bad. But the point is you can run through these efforts and begin to summarize qualitatively first and quantitatively later, later um, different sorts of threats. And then we can begin to combine um, this analysis of resiliency with the, um, this sort of threat summary. And we're going to use, the idea is we'll use these to map in this space um, the risk of different indicators. So, and, and of course, um, the, I don't need to be prescriptive about, um, and there's no, you know, we need to be prescriptive about the risk analysis. We argue that you need to do a risk analysis like you would in a stock assessment, essentially. But there's lots of ways to skin a cat. Um, or in this case, there's actually a hairless cat, so we shave. shave. There's lots of ways to shave a cat. Um, and we're working on all different sorts of ways. I think one of the more interesting ideas that we have is to sort of take some ideas from population viability analyses developed for the conservation literature and try to, um, try to apply those to ecosystems. Um, but it's, it's not straightforward. Um, and finally, uh, management actions. Um, so we need to think about um, what we're going to do, where we're going to do it, how much to do. I mean, it, it's a challenge. And the challenge is, is complicated because we we know ecosystems provide lots of stuff, goods and services that we take advantage of. Um, the services interact, often in ways we don't really understand or even know. Um, and people value um, different services in different ways. So um, what's the role of science in this process? I'd argue that, that Basically trying to understand how different ecosystem services interact is a way that we can really begin to inform management. Um, and so integrated ecosystems force us to think about trade-offs and often forces negotiation among different groups about different, um, different trade-offs. Um, and I want to take a, a brief tangent to say that in science, we're often forced or asked to negotiate science. And this is a pet peeve of mine. Um, and so I'm going to have a three-slide rant about why this is stupid. I'm going to use a very simple example of natural mortality. So the idea is we oftentimes uh, we know total mortality. We don't know um, the appropriate fishing mortality um, to use. And so you can imagine a situation where the total mortality is sustainable. There's, there's, there's some mortality out there that's sustainable. We might not know what it is, but it is something. Um, and if we go uh, so to a mortality that's less than that, um, we have persistence. If we go the other way, we have extinction. That's bad. So sometimes you sit around a room, people have different ideas. I mean, this is, not, this is such a simple example, it's not real, but you can imagine situations where people have different ideas about some parameter. And it's like, you know, here's mine, here's theirs, here's yours. And we sit around and get managers coming to you and they say, you know, can't you guys just work it out and make an average? So we average your mortality. Um, you know, weighted somehow, and you end up with this value here, which A is wrong, because there is a right answer. Um, and so the point is, oftentimes managers force us to deal with uncertainty in ways that are stupid. People in this room know about ways that are not stupid. And I think part of the trick of this, of the next section is that I'm going to talk about is expressing uncertainty in ways that aren't stupid. 
Um, so how do we do that? So we run everything um, for sure. I mean, definitely uh, for Puget Sound, if you think about Puget Sound, we love our habitats. Um, we want to have coastal development. We want to fish. We want orcas. We want it all. Um, and you know, it doesn't really work like that as it turns out. So again, just as a, an illustration of this using an ecosystem model, we did something where we um, played it with just herring uh, fishing. And we varied the amount of herring fishing in the model from zero to something like uh, MSY. Um, we left everything else um, alone, and then what I'm going to show you is trade-offs between these different components. So one is when we get everything that's possible in this, these scenarios. On zeros, we get nothing. Turns out if you don't fish herring, herring catch is zero, so it's, that's good. Um, um, we get plenty of lean cod, salmon. These metrics of ecosystem function are high. Um, you see demersal fish biomasses are mostly rockfish are here. Um, and so you get an idea of what, what the system would be like without herring. Um, and then we can have different herring scenarios. Here's um, a couple more scenarios. We have none. We have a light fishing. Light fishing, we're getting um, about 40% or so, 45% of, of MSY. And, and then we have heavy fishing. And you can see that there's a trade-off in lean cod catch um, with herring catch. And so when people sound might think of that as a trade-off between a small commercial fishery and a recreational fishery. Um, and you also see a change here in the planktivore to piscivore ratio. So I want to take this um, particular um, case here and apply it in two dimensions. So here we have the planktivore to piscivore ratio in herring yield. And so this gives us what's called, or what economists call it production possibility. It's, it separates the impossible from what's possible. So this line is the most we can get out of that system. So we can be anywhere we want to along that line. So not being along this line is stupid. Um, because it's inefficient. Um, so you can imagine if we were here, um, you know, this is, we can get either a uh, higher value of this particular um, metric of the ecosystem, or we can get more yield without affecting the ecosystem metric, but whatever, it's stupid. And this provides a tool for stakeholders and decision makers to then figure out what to do. They can compromise and sort of each get a little bit, or they can argue and one person can get more out of the other. But the point is that they need to move from what's inefficient um, to um, a situation that's more efficient. And I think it's a useful tool to help them think about trade-offs. Um, and I've, I mentioned ecosystem and ecopath a lot. Um, I'm going to just take a second and move beyond that um, and tell you about more sophisticated modeling that Isaac Kaplan has been um, leading along with uh, Beth Fulton, our secret um, agent in Australia, and Yvonne Cameron Ainsworth, um, this is Kristen Marshall, and Chris are all going to be involved in this as well. Um, so this is the Atlantis ecosystem model. This is a three-dimensional model. Um, you see it's um, there are slices of the coast separated by bathymetry. Um, in this model, there's an oceanographic ROMS model that's moving water, heat, and salt between um, different layers of, of depth and two dimensions. <coughs> um, the, this climate and oceanography submodel uh, feeds through biochemistry into a food web model. This is overlaid on a habitat template. Um, on this, there's a fisheries uh, model. And then this all feeds into an assessment and policy decision. And this model um, that I'm going to talk about results from the second goes from uh, Point Conception up to uh, Cape Flattery. And again, this is um, stuff that Isaac and Chris have been deeply involved in. Uh, uh, more than deeply. Uh, how it's deeper than deeply. Super deep. Um, um, the model has um, a series of functional groups like ecosystem. Um, 
And what I want to do now is just talk about an uh, example that we're doing right now. It's related to um, ITQs, um, in individual fishing quotas on the West Coast. So um, the council came to us with a variety of scenarios. Here's one scenario, scenario three. Um, it's, it's a pretty optimistic scenario about how fishing mortality will change on on some groups given um, the implementation of quotas, of individual fishing quotas, transferable quotas. And so these are, this is a group of deep uh, pisivores, this air tooth and halibut. You see fishing goes up on those. Um, Cabazon and rain cod, fishing goes up. Midwater rockfish, fishing goes up. Small deep rockfish, fishing goes up. Deep large rockfish, fishing goes up and small rockfish fishing goes up. So the idea of the scenario is there's more fishing, um, and that's because the food is more efficient and better able to avoid um, species like canaries that limit um, their fishing opportunities. So if, if you do this, um, and you subject uh, those changes of fishing mortalities in Atlantis, you end up with these results, which is, this is after 10 years, it shows a change in biomass. <clears throat> so for each of these groups, where one would be, it stays the same. You see, for a number of these groups, there's significant, um, substantial declines, like arrow tooth and halibut, there's a lot more fishing, they go down like 45%, um, same with lean cod and so forth. So if you fished things harder, there's less of them. Um, the interesting thing, though, is then what are the indirect effects of this? So, um, so these are groups that aren't fished. Um, up means there's a positive change, down means there's a negative change. And so we see pretty big changes in little demersal fish like um, scorpions, um, very minor changes in rockfish, um, squid, um, about a 4% change in shrimp, um, a pretty big increase in gelatinous zooplankton, and a minor change in copepods. So there are indirect effects, it looks like, from this particular fishing thing. And so the idea is that we can run these models. There's going to be trade-offs, in this case, between the state of the ecosystem and fisheries yield, because yield goes way up in that particular case. So um, I want to wrap up by saying that um, so I, I'm, I'm going on and I'm using a lot of models. And for me, it's uncomfortable because I'm, I'm not a big fan of the model. <laughs> you, you know, I've talked about an hour about models. I'm, I'm more of a guy that's comfortable with data. I, would, I think everybody realizes that these models are, are severely limited by data quality and um, availability, right? So garbage in, garbage out. And that's a real problem. Um, and, we just have them often in the fisheries service, but beyond the fisheries service, collected appropriate types of process data, ecological data, necessary to really develop um, strong ecosystem models and to really advise ecosystem managers in the, way, in the right way. We need to really understand better links between habitat and demographic rates, functional responses of predators. Um, and the strength of ecological interactions and connectivity between local populations. These are crucial, and we often have really lousy data, and we're just, you know, borrowing and making stuff up. It's, it's not a good situation. Um, one area that we're particularly interested in in my group, and that I won't have time to talk about, but I will mention, is um, all these models, especially the newer ones that people are using, are spatially explicit. We often have no information, even less information on those other things about how animals move through the environment, what they're doing when they go there, when they're there. And so we're engaged in a number of studies uh, on six scale sharks, um, some flatfish, rain cod, and seals, all in Puget Sound, looking at how these animals move through the environment, what habitats are using what they're doing and, and why they're doing it. Um, so I use really, this idea of integrated ecosystem assessment. <clears throat> um, is this, I, it, it, we're pitching this, but it's really just a bunch of boxes that organize the sort of e ecosystem tools that people have already developed in different ways. Um, it's a framework that takes us from management goals, the objectives, through management actions. 
and, and I think they help us think about the appropriate and rational management actions and then help us assess trade-offs among different goods and services. Um, and in a way, we're sort of at this crossroads. Um, we, we, for a long time, have been collecting data. I mean, getting data marine systems is torturous, and we've been doing it as, as a community for not that long, but pretty long, and we now have lots and lots of data. I mean, we more, but we have a lot of data. And I would argue that the future of ecosystem management, and indeed the future of the ecosystems and fisheries, lies in the hands of people who can integrate and synthesize this sort of information. Um, yeah, and I do think that we've reached a fork in the road. A fork where, on one hand, we can follow and continue both ecologically and in fisheries sort of a reductionist approach. Um, and I don't think that leads us very far. Instead, I would argue that if we take the road less traveled, um, um, a world that's, that's synthetic and integrates across disciplines, social sciences, and natural sciences, that we'll, we'll get to where we need to go. And I would argue that this notion of integrated ecosystem assessments is framework to move us on that path. Thanks. Questions? So we have time for a few questions. Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> yeah. Can you? Yeah. Um, yeah. So one, one question I have about the uh, um, you show the the driver impact state the user yeah. diagram. Um, I haven't seen it specifically with some of those elements in there. What occurs to me is you said. Well, maybe the management implication affects the, the demand and maybe it affects the fishing effort, but that seems to me to be a really critical detail that almost all management goes to the fishing effort without touching the sort of demand. And, yeah. You know, there's the danger you get this really, you know, if, if your demand doesn't match what your management system is doing, then you, you get out of whack. You know? Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I don't know if everybody heard, and Karen's point was on that diagram of driver pressure state impact uh, response. Uh, in a way, I kind of offhandedly said that um, we have a management response. It could affect seafood demand, for example, or fishing effort. Um, and Karen's point is a good one that it, it matters, that distinction matters, um, that if we affect effort without affecting demand, we'll have problems. Is that a fair? characterization. And I think it's worse than that. <laughs> um, and, and one of the sort of the realities of applying this in Puget Sound is that um, it gets very confusing because in some cases we have things that you might consider drivers or pressures like water quality. Um, the water quality certainly influences the state of, of the food web. Um, that's a dead spot I was told about. Don't stand there. Um, there is itself a, um, a state that people are interested in as a management goal. And so it actually gets incredibly confusing using that dip sort of thing. And, and because um, people want to bin things and have them in single bins and not have anything crossing bins. So, um, you know, it's, so it, it, it gets confusing. There's what we, we started in the talk, you talked about indicators, um, and you showed us some indicators that were some indicators that didn't. And, and this is something that's been done in a number of places around the world. I think we've, we've learned a lot about which indicators work, which ones don't. Um, what, we, what you had on your slide, though, which I'm sort of more interested in, is you said targets and limits. One of the reasons I would argue that your picture changed between 2000 and 2006 is not because we've done better science or better models, but because lawyers were going to sue people if you were below the line and said overfished, and so councils reacted to not being sued, and they reduced fishing 
mortality. What we don't have is the equivalent level for, dare I say, the ratio of the scores to uh, whatever your object yeah. was. To, for two weeks, one, we really don't understand the dynamics of that quantity well. And secondly, I don't think decision makers want to add into their repertoire things they can be sued over, yet another trigger level. So not only do you get sued if you don't have enough rockfish, you get sued because you have too many fiscivores. Yeah. How are you going to overcome that? How are we going to get to the point where we choose real targets and limits? Well, uh, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think I mean, this is a discussion we've been having in lots of different contexts. I believe that the, the most important thing is, is what you said, is that we have to have some management benchmarks. You can't, it's like in, doing a stock assessment without having, uh, knowing what your goal is. Um, and in, in fact, there was actually a severe disagreement between the U.S. and Canada over this fact on the concept of IEA. Canada is moving forward with IEAs without any benchmarks. Um, we've rejected that, um, in fact. Um, we believe that you have to have benchmarks. And it's unclear to us right now exactly how to get there. There's two parts of it. One is, um, I think we can get pretty far if we think about um, modeling in clever ways and begin to look for real non-linearities in these um, quantities and begin to show that, yeah, if you move past this point, you, you have a sudden shift in the ecosystem. So we can look for real ecological thresholds. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, and we're, we're going to do that. Um, when I've mentioned this to people, though, and asked a question like you have, um, the response I've gotten is that this is not a science question. That the management benchmarks, in fact, are just, they're, they're a policy decision, and it's OK if they're arbitrary. And then I would say, well, what about you know stock assessments? I mean, aren't those based at least somewhat in biology? And the answer is, yeah, sort of. Um, and you might disagree with that, but um, the people arguing with me don't. <laughs> um, and so I think, um, and, and I think this is an area like some other areas in fisheries where the onus is on the scientists to show these nonlinearities, to demonstrate in a conclusive way what appropriate scientifically based benchmarks are, and don't give policymakers a wiggle room to make up stuff that's arbitrary, because otherwise they will. I mean, if they have no science, they'll do something um, or nothing. And I think it's better if they're going to do something or nothing that it's based on science. So it's, I think that's our job. And we're doing it slowly. <laughs> but I think it's doable. I, I do. I, and the only, the only reason I, don't, I think we don't have it is because people haven't done it. People haven't tried hard enough. <laughs> Well, if there are no more uh, questions, we'll uh, turn out of the lobby where we hope um, the reception waiting for us. Uh,